Will Washington surprise people in the Big Ten in year one? Lots of turnover, new roster, new coach, new staff. Let's talk about it. Roman Tomashoff, Locked On Huskies, joining me here on the show. What's the state of Washington's roster right now? Spencer, you know, there's there's honestly a lot to be excited about with this roster. It's a young roster, uh, you know, after, as as you and I just discussed, losing 20 starters from last year's run to the national championship is going to hurt anybody. But we've seen a lot of nice pieces come in. Ephesians Prysock, the cornerback from Arizona, is one of the top transfers. Uh, Jonah Coleman, the running back, obviously re- retaining Will Rogers, retaining Drew as a party, the left tackle from San Diego State, retaining Jeremiah Hunter, the transfer from Cal, who's just, I, I think he's got the potential to be one of the best receivers in the Big Ten this upcoming season. There really is a lot to be excited about. There's still some holes on the roster. Uh, there's still questions that need to be answered along the offensive line, maybe another defensive tackle. But there's a lot of youth. There's a lot of promise and there's still some, some names that, you know, were, were big parts of Washington's run to the, the national championship last year, like Elijah Jackson, like Carson Bruner and Alfonso Tupatal linebacker. And then a, a guy who n- didn't really get to play a, a, any, any sort of part in that, but was awesome in 2022 in running back Cameron Davis, who's going to be back from an injury that he suffered for the season started. So there's, there's still a lot of reason to be excited. I like this coaching staff and there are just a lot of guys on this roster that are, are really chopping at the bit to step up and, and have their chance to, to contribute. I think the staff moves that Jed Fish has made have been good. It's a very NFL centric group. You know, you've got Brennan Carroll, the son of Pete Carroll. You've got Steve Belichick, the form of the son of, of course, Bill Belichick, because I don't know that there's anybody else with that last name, at least that I'm aware of in the football coaching world. But the last that people probably heard from this Washington roster was, well, they've lost 20 or 21 or 22 starters from the, what sure. what they had last year. And DeBoer is gone. Everything's in chaos. And sure, it, it's definitely a, a, a ground roots build up job for for Jed Fish and company like that. That's what they have to do. But if you just look at some of the key spots, Will Rogers, Jonah Coleman, Jeremiah Hunter, I, I could find a number of quarterback, running back, receiver combos in the Big Ten next year that are worse than those three guys. I, I think yeah, Hunter sure. is fantastic coming over from Cal. We know Jonah Coleman is very good. Will Rogers, I don't know that his ceiling is that high, but an experienced quarterback who's thrown in a Mike Leach offense is going to have a very high floor. Who's blocking for these guys? So that's a very good question. Where Drew as a party, as I mentioned, was one of the top rated transfers coming out of San Diego State. He's probably going to man the left tackle spot. And then somebody that I'm really high on who won't be practicing in the spring, but I would expect to be ready by the start of fall camp by the start of the season is offensive lineman guard Memelar, who honestly had a shot to start in this past season in 2023 before he suffered an injury in fall camp. Uh, that Those are probably going to be the left side of the line. And then there, there are going to be three open spots there that we'll see what happens through spring, what happens happens with the fall. Washington's getting a late start on the spring practice. They're not starting till the beginning of April, just kind of at the, at the, the very end of the window where it's recommended for teams to start. And one of the reasons is that Jed Fish is still looking to bring in some guys along the offensive line. And I wouldn't be surprised if as some names trickle into the transfer portal here in April, or as, as we get into April, I, I don't, I don't know what time is in it anymore. It's, it's early March now and that blows my mind. But as, as we get into that, that next transfer portal window, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, they go after Branson Hickman from SMU to man the center position for his final season or Marcus Bryant, their tackle, who is also looking in the, uh, to get in the transfer portal after being all AAC last season. So there are still some names that, and obviously there are names that we, we don't even know that could be out there just yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are three transfer players manning those spots or even two. And then, you know, somebody like, former four-star recruit Elijah Jaquette maybe competes and earns a spot in the spring or two high upside redshirt freshmen in Kaylee to fire Sione Fasolo, who are really promising, really big bodied raw guys that have, have, have an opportunity to really make a name for themselves this spring. By the way, we're technically in the middle of March. If you cut it up into three segments in a 31 day <laughs> month, 10, 10 and 10, we're, we're, in, we're into the middle fair, of March now. Fair. Technically speaking, I agree. Time is a social construct and doesn't you know mean anything. But I, I think for Washington, they, they have done a pretty solid job of much like Alabama and a, a guy who we shall not mention for this particular segment has kind of stabilized the roster a bit. But yeah. can they go into the Big Ten? And, and, and surprise people because the expectation, as I talked about nationally, is that, oh, they're going to be a big pullback team. And yeah, I, I expect them to pull back, but will sure. they go all the way back to where TCU went 
and and be and be a five and seven team i would think not because i look at the schedule roman i see bare minimum bare minimum worst case scenario five wins and and i don't think that that's where i would pick washington's record to end up their win total on FanDuel is seven and a half last time the huskies had a first year head coach an experienced transfer quarterback and a win total of seven and a half they went 11 and two in the pac 12 I'm not picking that here. I don't think that's going to play out. But is Washington being overlooked as a team that, you know, could could make some noise, could give a team a loss that they're not expecting this year? They have a lot of heavy hitters on their schedule. I I would certainly say so, because when you when you look at at some of the 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 just the way the schedule falls where early on it's Eastern Michigan, it's Weber state before you get to the, uh, the apple cup, which will be held at, at Lumen field this season, which I'm personally very excited about. And then after that, it's Northwestern and Rutgers where, yeah, you got to go to Piscataway and that's going to be tough going across the country. But when you look at that and you're also going back to Jed Fish's home States, so that's pretty fun. But when you, when you look at that, there is a legitimate chance that this team could start five and zero. Oh. And then as you as you look at the fan duel total, you only need three more wins to get there. And, you know, there's a UCLA on your schedule. Indiana's on the schedule. Iowa's always a tough out, but that that's certainly a winnable game for this team. Where if you look at that, you just you look at just the remaining seven games in the schedule. Michigan, USC, Oregon, those are gonna be really tough. But there's still four other games on there where you look at it and you say, yeah, I can see this team going eight and four. I can see them going nine and three and surprising with an upset victory over a USC or somebody. It's it's certainly very possible. And with the experience that Jed Fish has, with what he was able to do at Arizona, we know how good his scheme is. And that's it's something that really does impress me when you talked with the coaching staff a little bit earlier. This scheme is going to play very, very well at the college level. And I, it's obviously something we won't see until the fall, but something I, I'm really looking forward to watching. With how with how Washington has you know worked to reload, we'll see what they do in the spring. I don't think five and zero is off the table, but between Washington State at a neutral site, but it's in Seattle, so essentially a home game for the Huskies. Northwestern at home, who was a bowl team last year that went into the Vegas Bowl and beat Kyle Whittingham and the Utes, are going at Rutgers. I don't think that that's a lock sequence of events to all be wins for Washington. I think they're capable. But I don't know that I'd rule out a loss in those first five games. But then the back half of their schedule, boy, it gets tough fast. Michigan at Iowa. Then you have to go at Indiana after a bye. I think they'll be fine there in Bloomington. But then they come back home. USC, who I think is a better team. At Penn State, who I also think is a better team. Host UCLA. I think Washington's better than the Bruins. You go at Oregon and the Ducks, I think, have got the better roster. And that game that game is being played in eugene how many wins can washington fans expect to get in the second half of the year what would a good number be for for those second seven games i would say if they can manage three wins then that's really great where that because that involves you know maybe winning at iowa i don't think that they can go into penn state and win that's going to be a really really tough game but when you just look at what that schedule is usc and ucla are both at home so, you know, we, we, we've seen crazier things happen at Husky Stadium than beating whatever USC might be ranked this year, you know, and beating them in the top five and everything. It's it's it, it's all happened before. So I would say that three wins is kind of where my expectation would be, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a fourth in there somewhere. That being said, nine and three does kind of feel like the ceiling for where this team might be. It's, it's something that my co-host Lars Hansen and I have talked about over on Lockdown Huskies is it's very realistic to see an eight and four, a nine and three, and you know, with a couple more pieces along the offensive line, this this team really is something to be excited about moving into the Big Ten. Roman Tomashoff locked on Huskies coming by here to talk all things dogs up there in Montlake. Roman, thanks so much. Spencer, as always, thanks for having me. A lot of changes in college football over the last couple of years. Most of them stink. These latest ones don't.